Hey folks, welcome back to Understanding Revelation. This is part 12 in our series, and today we are talking about the great sign of Revelation 12. Wow, what a great chapter this is, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. We're going to talk today about what the great sign is, the, the people that are involved, the, the woman, the dragon, the male child, and, and what all is happening, what it means for us. We're also going to take a look at should we be looking for a sign in the heavens in a literal sense, or has that already happened, as some may have claimed? So let's dive in. Today we are looking at uh, Revelation chapter 12. Again, hey, I'm your host. I'm Randy Bond, uh, leading a Bible study through this, uh, mainly for our church family, uh, but so glad that you are joining in if you're not a part of our church. Uh, we want people to know, uh, you know, kind of a, a sense of of, of what the Bible is saying about what's going to happen at the end. We're doing kind of a big overview of the book of Revelation, not getting into all the nitty gritty details, but getting awfully close in a lot of places. Uh, so I hope that you'll uh, continue to join us. Uh, we have a lot more videos that you can watch if you have enjoyed this one. Uh, again, thank you for those that have been watching. Uh, the, this, this episode on who the two witnesses are has been by far the most watched uh, video that we've had. A lot of people looking for answers to questions in Revelation. Revelation 12 uh, is, is the beginning of a new section. We just saw at the end of Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet being blown. And that's a significant event. Uh, we looked previously at the relationship between the seven signs, the seven uh, trumpets, and uh, the seven seals, I'm sorry, the seven trumpets and uh, the seven bowls of wrath. Uh, I'll leave a link up here uh, to that video if you want to catch that. But when we get to chapters 12 through 15, we're looking at a section that kind of steps back to give us an overview of some of the big players and big events that are going to be happening. So again, we've said that Revelation is not written strictly in a chronological order. And this is one of those places where very clearly we're going to take a look way back in history and, and then it's going to look at maybe some future events as well. Uh, but 12, 13, 14, and in the first part of 15 are really giving us a big picture context. When we were in uh, chapter uh, 10 with uh, and, and chapter 11, uh, looking at the, the two witnesses, all of a sudden, without any kind of fanfare, uh, we see the beast being mentioned. There's no real introduction. It just says th that the beast kills the two witnesses, and nothing more is given. So now when we're moving into chapter 12, we still don't get a whole lot about the beast. That's chapter 13. Now we're going to see a little bit about the power behind the beast. So this is all being set up to that key player in the book of Revelation, the Revelation 13 beast that's just mentioned in chapter 11, but is going to be uh, given some further illumination as we move into the next chapter. But to understand uh, the beast, we have to understand the power behind the beast. And that's part of what Revelation 12 is setting up. So here is Revelation 12, verses 1 through 5. And it says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Wow, a lot is packed into here. So let's see if we can unpack this a little bit. Uh, so first off, uh, let's talk about uh, some overarching things, because I, I don't want you to, to watch this and then, you know, tune out before you get to the big picture, or that we get so caught up in the details that you miss the big picture, because chapter 12 is really critical to understanding the whole book of Revelation. And so here's just some things that uh, we need to see. Number one, the war that we are in. This cosmic conflict that we see happening throughout the book of Revelation is very ancient. Uh, it goes back to the very beginning. And so chapter 12 is giving us some historical perspective. Uh, 
because it's real easy for us to fall into a trap of why is this happening to me? And, and, and we, we want to see maybe that persecution complex or that, you know, we, we tend to have that, that victim identity uh, that can come through. But what we're seeing is that, man, this is far bigger than who we are and that this has been going on far longer than what we can imagine. And it's not just about us here on earth, that there is very much a spiritual component. And that's the second thing is that the war began in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realm. And the final battles are going to be fought in the earthly realm. Uh, so what began in heaven is going to be wrapped up, consummated uh, at the end here on earth. So insignificant pale blue dot, uh, as, as it was once called um, when one of the satellites uh, turned and took a picture of earth from about Neptune, and it was just this tiny little speck in dust. Uh, that little speck of dust is going to be the centerpiece of the final battle. That's amazing. Uh, number three, we, we see, and this is so important to understand, is that Satan is a defeated deceiver with limited time. Uh, one of the incredible truths, and we're going to talk more about this, is that even though it seems like Satan is invincible, that he's winning, uh, he is already defeated. He is waging guerrilla warfare in many respects, moved to one last stand, but in the overall scheme, he is defeated and he's going to meet his ultimate demise. He is doomed. Uh, he was defeated and we are protected because of the cross. This is something that we need to understand. And I don't mean a religious symbol, uh, you know, some wooden or whatever type of material that you make it out of. I'm talking about what Jesus did, his work on the cross. So I'm talking about the person and his work uh, that accomplishes this protection from the enemy. So we'll dive more into that uh, in a moment. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the three major characters that we're seeing uh, here in these first five verses. Uh, the first is the woman. The second is the great red dragon. And then the third is the male child. Um, so here's um, what we do see, the descriptions of these people, and a little bit about uh, what's happening, what's going on with them. So the woman is described as being in labor, uh, that she, and, and that she does give birth in this passage. Uh, but her description is amazing. It is, she's clothed with the sun, the moon is beneath her feet, and she's crowned with 12 stars. So a very radiant, uh, celestial-looking personality. Uh, the second uh, that we're going to see is the, the great red dragon again, uh, described with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. Uh, these are diadems. Uh, so these are crowns of royalty. Um, so the authority and power, not a victor's crown, but the crown of I'm, I rule, I own. Um, and he sweeps a third of the stars from the sky and he seeks to devour the child. Now, interestingly, the description of the great red dragon is almost identical to the description of the beast that the dragon is going to give his power to. So that description of the beast is going to reflect that he has the same authority and power because the dragon is given that to the beast. Uh, the male child is caught up to God and to his throne. Uh, so not a whole lot is mentioned about the male child, but we know uh, who he is, that he is the one who's going to be ruling the nations with a rod of iron. And that's an important description. Uh, so who are these people? Uh, well, we know for sure who the great red dragon is because this very chapter tells us who he is. Uh, the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. You're going to see that same kind of description in Revelation chapter 20 uh, when he is captured and bound and cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Um, but here we, we very clearly see him with the, the, that, that descriptor, the devil, and that name, if it is indeed a proper name, uh, Satan means accuser, uh, so, you know, that, that kind of coincides with the nature of what he does. But one of the key descriptions of the great red dragon is that he is a deceiver. That's his greatest power, is that he deceives people. He makes what is false look real uh, or seem to be real. Uh, he is a pretender. So the, the seven, let me go back to that description there, seven heads. Remember, seven is that number of completion, of perfection. Uh, it, it's that omniscient aspect that is seen with the seven heads. He is like all knowing, all wise, uh, perhaps, or all authoritative. That's further seen, though, better seen in the ten horns. He is all powerful. 
uh, complete power, complete strength. Horns represent strength. And the seven crowns, that's authority. That, that global dominion uh, that we're going to see happening with the beast is pictured here. He is called in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world. Now, he is not a God in the truest sense of the term, uh, but he is treated as a God and acts as though he is a God. And that's one of the key things that we're going to understand and that this chapter and other chapters here are going to help us to understand. So uh, the second person uh, within this section of scripture that is clearly identified is the male child. And this is very clearly Jesus that is being re referenced here. Uh, he is described as one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That is clearly a reference to Psalm uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is a strongly messianic psalm uh, pointing to the Messiah, pointing to Jesus. And so we know that the male child that is being referenced here is Jesus. Uh, we know that the great red dragon is Satan. We're told that. But we're not told exactly who the woman is. The woman is the mysterious figure in all of this, and this is where a lot of the speculation tends to fly around with this, along with some other things here in this chapter. But one of the biggest things is who is the woman? There is no real clear definition from within the passage where it says the woman is this, like we see in the great red dragon. The great red dragon is that ancient serpent, the ancient deceiver who deceived in the garden, who continues to deceive the world, and is Satan. Um, we don't have those kind of clear markers like we do with the male child being Jesus. Uh, so let's see uh, if we can kind of flesh out who that might be. Uh, so certainly from the Catholic perspective, and at first glance, I remember reading this as a kid and wondering, wait a minute, is this Mary? Is it somebody else? Because Mary gives birth to the child, but there's parts of it that don't seem to line up. Well, the strength of this is uh, this point of view is that she, Mary literally did give birth to Jesus. And so there's no question that Mary is in mind about this, but is she the fullness of that imagery of the woman? See, the weakness of this idea is that while the dragon, <clears throat> excuse me, does seek to devour the child during Mary's lifetime, and he does that uh, through Herod the Great. Remember uh, in uh, Matthew, you have that account of uh, Herod um, in entertaining the wise men, finding out the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, and then kills every child under the age of two. Uh, and, and so uh, you, you see throughout scripture in the Old Testament, and particularly in those two passages that give us an idea of who Satan is and um, Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, that Satan often operates as the power behind the throne, that he is the one who is actually working in the world, but he's using human agents to do that. And quite frankly, he's still doing that. Um, and so uh, what we do see, going back to the weakness here, is that the final assault against the woman appears to be in the last days. And that would be after Mary has long been dead. Uh, and, and so that would even be true when John was writing this, that uh, John is writing this in, in 90 AD, and it is highly likely that Mary has already died by this point. And so I don't think that the woman in view here is Mary although she is certainly a part of it, and she was used as that, she's not the totality of the woman uh, in view here. Uh, some have uh, argued that she is the church, uh, that the woman is the church. Well, the strength of this is that the church is indeed uh, called with some references that, that, um, that connotate a woman, like the bride. Um, 2 John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, one of the um, interpretive issues with 2 John is the elect lady. Is John talking there about uh, an individual woman, or is he talking about a specific church? Uh, so that, that has that, that aspect of uh, lady is actually a reference to the, the body of believers that John is writing to. And, and part of that stems from uh, a reference in the Shepherd of, Hermi, of Hermes. Um, Shepherd of Hermes was actually one of the books that was put forward to be considered as part of the New Testament. Uh, so there were a lot of people that put a lot of um, credence behind the book. Now, ultimately, it, it doesn't make the cut. People realize, you know, this really isn't uh, scripture. It's a helpful book. A lot of early Christians read it. 
Uh, it's a worthy read. It does indeed talk about end times. It has a very strong premillennial view, but a very strong post-tribulation view. It does see the church going through the tribulation. So very early Christian writing. But in that, uh, Hermes has um, a vision, and, and it's a woman. And the woman is clearly told uh, to be the church in that vision. Well, the weakness to this point of view is that the church did not technically exist at the time of the birth of Jesus. The church exists as a result of Jesus. So you see the, the woman giving birth to Jesus, uh, but it's actually Jesus who, to kind of use that figurative language, gives birth to the church. So I, that, that has a, a weak point of view there. Um, the, the third and, and very promising point of view uh, is that the, the woman represents Israel. Uh, so the strength of that is that Israel is described as a woman in labor in Micah 4.10. Now notice in that, she's described as a, look at there, I'm using a feminine there. Israel is described uh, as a woman in labor, but it's because of the judgment of God. And similarly in Isaiah 66, 7 through 10, uh, you see that kind of uh, woman labor imagery applied to Israel. Um, now this could also be an allusion to Joseph's vision in Genesis uh, 39. So you remember Joseph, uh, the, 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 one of the younger of the, the 12 tribes, has this dream of the stars uh, bowing down and worshiping him along with the sun and the moon. So he's got this constellation, the celestial kind of vision. But in that, um, his father is the sun, the, the S-U-N, uh, his mother is the moon, and his brothers are the 11 stars that are bowing down with him possibly being the 12th star. Now, there, there's something to be said for that. However, the weakness of this is while the celestial elements are indeed present uh, in both Genesis 39 and Revelation 12, um, none of the elements are actually make up the woman. Uh, they surround her, but they're distinct from her. So if you look very carefully at Revelation 12, the woman isn't made up of these things. She is clothed with the sun. The moon is not a part of her, but under her feet. And the stars form a crown over her, not being a part of her. So, you know, both are present. You, maybe that's it, but I see that as a weakness to that view. I think um, more appropriately is just kind of uh, associating with the people of God. Now, certainly uh, Israel, believing Israel is a part of that. Uh, so the people of God, or uh, more generically, the, the believing community. Uh, so it represents the people of faith both before and after the birth of Christ. So that would be uh, genetically, uh, ethnically Israel only uh, before Jesus and both ethnically Israel um, and Gentiles who have faith in Christ after uh, Jesus comes. Uh, so that tends to be where I would land on this is that it's more representative of the believing community. So so it, it, the, the words Israel and church are so loaded. Um, the, the, the terms have a lot of connotations when we're talking in, in terms of eschatology. So I want to be careful about that uh, as we're, we're talking about this. So the pure woman, the believing community, is set in stark contrast to the whore of Babylon in Revelation 17. So remember when we looked at the, the letters to the seven churches, that adultery, that Jezebel kind of figure that is in there, uh, that, is, that, that sexual immorality is probably a reference to uh, believers or people who are associated with the believing community that are also practicing idolatry. It's spiritual unfaithfulness. Uh, this is certainly the way that is portrayed in the Old Testament. Hosea is a beautiful picture. Well, not so beautiful in the sense, but it is, it is portraying Israel as being a, a, an adulteress, a prostitute because she's seeking after the Baals and Molech and all of those kind of things, rather than being the faithful wife. Uh, so this, in the same way, like Proverbs, has the beautiful woman of wisdom contrasted with uh, the, the prostitute, which is those who are going after foolishness, not going after the things of God. We have the same kind of contrast here in Revelation 7, um, 12 and 17. So that's part of what's being uh, set uh, in contrast in this book is the believing community, is this pure woman, uh, the bride of Christ uh, versus uh, the, the whore of Babylon and, and all of her uh, spiritual unfaithfulness. So the question when, when we're looking at this section is, should we be looking for a sign in the sky? Now, back in 2017, this was a buzz 
uh, in, the, in the Christian community, those that were looking uh, for signs in the last days, and certainly on YouTube, there were a lot of videos. By the way, uh, it is hard to find good videos about Revelation on, uh, on YouTube. I, I, I struggle. There are a lot of uh, really, uh, there, there's some well-prepared videos, uh, but not great content in a lot of those. So, you know, if you're watching this, I hope this, you know, maybe is a little you know, helpful for you. Uh, but, you know, when you get into to some of these things like the 144,000, the two witnesses, and now uh, the sign, there are some interesting ideas. I'll, I'll put it that, that way uh, that are out there. Uh, and so uh, back in 2017, this became a passage of a lot of focus because it talks about this great sign appearing in heaven. And so some people were taking this in a very little sense. And we see that the woman is clothed with the sun, uh, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 uh, stars. So here's kind of a, a look at that. Uh, this is Virgo. Let me give you another image here uh, so you can see that more fully. So bottom left over here, this is the constellation Virgo, the virgin, the woman. And you can see on September 23rd, 2017, we had this unique astronomical alignment. Uh, where within Virgo, uh, we had the sun actually coming uh, next to or within the constellation Virgo. And that happens every September. That's just part of the, the cycle of the, the moon moving through those uh, 12 constellations. It's called the zodiac constellations, uh, but don't confuse that with astrology, although that is based a lot on the same kind of movement of the celestial bodies through that. It's, it's that, that plane of the orbit of the sun uh, as it crosses through these various constellations in relationship to the earth. And so, you know, that happens every September. That's not that big of a deal. You'll see that at the, at her feet is the moon. Um, and then above her is the constellation Leo, which has nine stars within the constellation. But unique on this date was that there were three planets that were also within uh, that, that reach above the head of Virgo, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Um, now, the, what people really uh, got caught up on is that Jupiter was also uh, present kind of within the womb of, um, of Virgo. Now, some have said, and I have not been able to, to really uh, research this out, but uh, they were saying that Jupiter was actually uh, in the womb for 42 weeks, the normal human gestation period, and then she comes out, or Jupiter comes out at the end. Uh, now, some were taking this to the point of saying, and there was a, a big documentary. It was actually talked about on PBS because it was released just a few days before this event. Uh, it was an AT&T production, whatever that meant. Um, but a, a documentary that was talking about this and, and, and one of the people in there was putting forth the idea that out of Virgo uh, was going to come around that time, uh, this planet X, Nibiru, uh, that was going to cause all these cataclysmic issues. Um, well, you know, we're three years later, almost to the date, and we still haven't seen Nibiru or, or anything come out of that. Um, so here is, you know, kind of how this would look if you were going to Stellarium, which is a great piece of software that I've used, uh, locating constellations and planets and things like that. I, I, I love doing that kind of thing. Wish I could do it more. I'm in city now, so don't see it as much as when I lived out in the country and uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, but here you can see, um, you know, Virgo, uh, and Leo and how that would be seen uh, in the sky, so to speak. Now, what is interesting about this is that this did take a uh, uh, place on the Jewish feast of Rosh Hashanah, uh, the Jewish New Year. Uh, and that is, I think, an important thing. But was this really it? Was this the sign? Now, pre-September 23rd, 2017, there was a lot of talk that this is it. There's going to be this great cataclysmic event. It's going to be, you know, revelation kind of uh, activity that's happening. But if you do a, a Google search of things that happen uh, on September 23rd, there's nothing globally significant that really happens. Uh, it is a rather muted day as far as uh, newsworthy features go. Uh, no great cataclysms, no great disasters, uh, no great wars that broke out. Uh, you know, nothing that was at least visible that has been reported, uh, it, it has been seen and all those things. So, you know, it's an interesting uh, kind of coincidence. However, here's one of the difficulties with that view. 
uh, this may have actually happened four other times just in the last thousand years. So if we were to go back another thousand years to the point of John writing, you know, would it have happened another three or four times? I don't know. I haven't taken the time to do the research. Now, watching the videos, they tell me, oh, you know, we've looked back uh, 6,000 years, and this is the only time that it's happened. Well, maybe with that exact alignment, but you can see uh, the, the 12 stars. You can see the sun clothing Virgo, Jupiter with her and uh, the moon, all of those features in these four dates that are given. Uh, so that, that makes it rather difficult to say that this was a unique once in every 6,000 year kind of event. Uh, the, the bigger difficulty, and, and regardless of where, whether or not that's happened four times or zero times in the last thousand years, or the last 6,000 years, the great sign is pointing to historic events not necessarily future events. So I'm not sure why we would be looking for that particular sign again, where when you're looking in Revelation 12, the vast majority of what is being talked about is in the past. So I don't know that we need to be looking for this yet again. A sign is something that is pointing to something greater, uh, to another event uh, perhaps, or greater truth. And this is pointing back to the historical perspective of what has happened between uh, the, the woman, the dragon, and the male child, and what that means for the dragon. So let's jump in because this is where it continues. Verses seven through nine. So it says now, now in some translations it says then. So let me just pause here. Uh, the Greek word is kai. Uh, and Kai is a conjunction that can be translated in a number of different ways, and, then, uh, but, now, uh, all those kind of things would be appropriate. And it's interesting, when you look at the English translations, almost all of them have that as a then. So this is after um, the, the male child has ascended uh, into heaven. So we know that that's Jesus. We know that the, the, that the great dragon pursued him uh, to devour him, um, certainly when he was a baby. You can maybe even look at the temptation as one of those other chances. And certainly the cross uh, was one of those uh, moments where it seems like uh, the dragon is trying to gain victory over the Messiah, the male child. Uh, so it's after that, then war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. And, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, let me just quickly point out, because this was something kind of cool that I, I realized as I was going through this study. It says uh, that war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against uh, the dragon. It's not the dragon that's initiating this. It's Michael and his angels that are taking the the offense. They are on the offensive and the dragon and his angels are on the defensive. So that, that's, that's a pretty cool picture that uh, we, we have this proactive step uh, that Michael and his angels are taking. So Michael uh, is the, uh, the archangel. Now there's a little bit of um, question or debate. There's some who say Michael is the archangel. However, in Daniel, uh, Michael is referred to as one of the chief princes, one of the, the archangels, if you will. Uh, in heaven. But in this case, we do see Michael as the general here, and his angels are fighting against the dragon. And the dragon also has his own uh, angels. Now, I'm not going into great detail, so let me just mention this here. This is the passage of scripture where the idea that, that Satan takes a third of the angels with him. Uh, and, and we do see very clearly that he has angels that are on his side. Uh, and and that, that idea of the third goes back to those first five, uh, five verses where the dragon sweeps down a third of the stars of the, in, in the heavens and casts them to the earth. Now, reading that carefully, it kind of makes me wonder, is a third actually uh, the, the real number? Uh, in part, because the dragon seems to be inflicting damage on angels, that casting them down to the earth is the same language that is here in this passage about what happens to him. It says that uh, in verse nine, and the great dragon was thrown down. It's that same word in the Greek, that word balo, uh, to cast down. And so Satan is cast down, 
because of defeat. So it makes me wonder if the angels were defeated by Satan. It, it, it just is not as clear cut. And this is the only passage uh, in the Bible that gives any kind of sense of that. Now, it may be that it is actually uh, a third. And the reason why they're cast down is because they have sided with the dragon. He has deceived them. Uh, Satan has deceived those angels and they have sided with him. And now that was their fate as well. So it's not only Satan being cast down, but there. So all that to say is it may be a third of the angels. I just want you to have a little bit of the, the backdrop to say, uh, to understand this is where that idea comes from. And it could be a, a third of the angels sided with Satan, but it may not be. And, and, and that's, um, you know, not really the most important thing. What we do see is that Satan is cast down, his angels are cast down, and that he does have indeed a cadre of angels that are with him, but they don't nearly number the number of the, the angels that are, the good angels that are siding with God still. If that is an accurate number, we still have a two to one uh, in favor of God's angels, that two thirds are still sided with God, one third uh, with Satan. And big question in this uh, passage here, that was a great rabbit trail, uh, but this is a, uh, one of the questions that swirls around uh, Revelation 12 is, when did that war take place? Uh, or when does it take place? Uh, so that is a, a, a question because that has big implications on, on how we see other parts of Scripture. So did this happen uh, before or you know, during the Garden of Eden uh, time frame? Uh, was it because of the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus? Or is it at some point in the future? So that would be when does the war take place if it's at a, at a future point? So let's examine uh, each of these. Uh, you see the lightning strike here, uh, and that's reminiscent of uh, what Jesus said in Luke 10, 18. So when the disciples come back, uh, he sent them out. They come back and they're like, wow, you know, even the demons have to obey us. And he said, said to them, I saw, past tense, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So. Revelation 12 talks about that war breaking out in heaven, and he was cast down. So we've got that past tense kind of language that's there. This is very clearly a past tense, a singular event. It's in the aorist tense, if you know anything about Greek. It's a point in time, one time only kind of action that we see. And so Jesus speaks as though it's already happened by the time he's saying that, like it happened sometime before he came on the scene on earth. Um, and then we also see Isaiah chapter 14 uh, and also Ezekiel chapter 28. Again, these are the two passages that, that seem to be pointing to um, the, uh, the rise and fall of Satan, if you will. Um, so Isaiah 14 says, ha, ha, excuse me, how you have fallen from heaven. So here it's more of a perfect tense uh, where we had an action with ongoing results. Uh, and it says, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, O destroyer uh, of nations. Uh, so both of these have that sense that this happened before that was happened. So Isaiah is about 700 years before Christ. Uh, and so at some point before that, did that happen? Now, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, uh, we can see that uh, Satan still had access to heaven between Eden and Jesus. Uh, so Job chapter one, verse six, and also Zechariah chapter three, verse one, uh, very clearly in Job one. And Job is probably the oldest book uh, in the Old Testament as far as the date, as far as many Bible scholars would, uh, would say that it's, it, it may be older and haven't been written down than when Moses came along and wrote down the first five books, the Torah or the Pentateuch. Uh, so Satan still had access to, to heaven uh, in Job 1. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God, very clear reference to angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came along with them. This is a troubling kind of verse, uh, you know, on a number of different points, but I just want you to see that you got Satan still having access to heaven, presenting themselves before, himself before the Lord in the throne room, just like all the other angels. Um, we also see um, the victory hymn in this chapter. So later on in verses 10 through 11, we're going to see this, but the victory hymn seems to point to the blood, the, what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection and his ascension uh, as the catalyst for Satan's removal. So the context of the, uh, the, the war in this victory hymn 
uh, going to hand in hand seems to be because of what Jesus did on the cross, his ascension brought about the removal of Satan from heaven at that point. Uh, so it says, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. So once you get those two connections in there, but that, that would be significant uh, that maybe indeed uh, Satan had rebelled, but he still had access to heaven. Uh, so he rebelled and, and, and then later led to the rebellion of humanity and the garden, uh, but still had access from the Garden of Eden on to the point of Jesus. But once Jesus did his work, he, that's not the case anymore. Uh, the other uh, point of view on this is that it is at some future point in heaven. Uh, ver chapter 12, verse 12, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down uh, to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now in that context, this is sandwiched between two time references in chapter 12. Uh, so it's um, between the woman being nourished and protected from the dragon for 1,260 days and also uh, being nourished and protected again uh, for time, times, and half a time. So both of those are that same reference to time and it's rep it, it's in the, that fall of Satan uh, is sandwiched between those two time markers. So does the fall of Satan coincide with the beginning of that uh, three and a half year mark there. Uh, so is this kind of that, that midpoint in the, the tribulation period? And this is when it's about to all um, come unglued, uh, so to speak, because he's now come down and you see him giving uh, his authority to the beast. It's entirely possible. Uh, I kind of lean toward that this happened uh, at that second option there, uh, that once Jesus conquered um, uh, sin and death on the cross, that there was no more place for him. Um, and I, I do want you to see that the, the first time reference uh, in this occurs before the dragon is cast down. Uh, so it may not be absolutely uh, a slam dunk to say, oh, because these are sandwiched between the two time markers, that it, it's referencing this and it has to do that. That first time marker is actually mentioned before Satan is cast down, before that war in heaven uh, breaks out. That's verse six. He's cast down verse eight. Uh, so that, you know, could, you know, puncture the balloon of that, that idea there. Uh, but we need to, um, to, to watch the, the time references in this chapter because time is greatly compressed. Uh, here's a great example in verse five. Uh, the woman gives birth to a male child who is Jesus the one who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So it's that same word in the Greek for both male child and her child. But we know that Jesus did not die as a baby. Uh, Jesus died as an adult. So we have a great compaction of time where everything is just kind of seen as a whole uh, rather than you know, the individual components of the time, the timeline itself. And that's maybe an important clue as to looking at the rest of chapter 12. Now, uh, here are just some of the, the four key events that we see of the dragon in chapter 12. He sweeps a third of the stars, casting them to the earth. So this could be that pre-Edenic uh, kind of um, rebellion that takes place. Uh, when Satan rebels against God and then later leads humanity re to rebel, that's the second great rebellion uh, in scripture. And so it could be that he rebels, and it's at that time uh, that he also sweeps down uh, the, a third of the stars and casts them to the earth. So we're looking at something that happens way back uh, at the beginning, uh, so at Garden of Eden or even just before that happens. Uh, and then we see the pursuit of the woman and the child. So now this is something that's taking place thousands of years later, if that's indeed the sequence of how things are playing out chronologically. And then we see the, the war uh, with Satan and his angels. Uh, so this is um, taking place in heaven. And then finally, uh, we have the pursuit of the woman and uh, the woman's other children, which seems to be at some point in the future uh, during the tribulation period. Uh, so we have at least four different uh, events that are taken over a long, long period of time, but they seem to be really compressed in this chapter. 
So just be aware of that as you're reading through and interpreting uh, this chapter that it's not just an easy, oh, this is all happening at once kind of thing. It's, it's deeply compressed. It's almost like studying history uh, and we can miss the time gaps that are in between. Uh, I mean, in our minds for American history, you know, 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. Uh, and then we have uh, the English uh, setting up Jamestown, the Mayflower coming along, and then we have the Declaration of Independence. There's a lot that happens in between all those events, but uh, we see those major points, but they get really compressed and don't realize just how far apart they are. I mean, we're almost as close to the Declaration, the signing of the Declaration of Independence as the signers of the Declaration of Independence were to Columbus discovering the Americas. That's a lot of time. Uh, and so, I mean, Declaration of Independence seems like ancient history, particularly from um, an American's point of view of history. So let's talk about the activity and the fate of Satan, Satan in Revelation. This is really the first key moment that Satan is introduced in the books, uh, uh, the book of Revelation. In chapters two and three, we have a couple of references to Satan. Uh, you know, the synagogue of Satan and that they really belong to Satan and so forth. So there's at least a little bit of reference, but now we actually are getting introduced to uh, the person of Satan and his activity. Uh, so in chapter 12, verse four, we have that reference to the heavenly rebellion. Uh, we see that there's a war in heaven that he loses. He's cast uh, uh, to earth. Now he's making war on the people of God, on the saints. Uh, chapter 13, we're going to see him transfer his power to the beast. So Satan is incorporeal. He does not have a body, but he's going to give his power to a corporeal creature. Um, and then he's going to be later on, uh, chapter 20, there's a big gap. He's still at work uh, behind the scenes, but we don't see him really mentioned again explicitly until chapter 20, uh, where he's going to be bound and cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Then he's going to be released briefly. Uh, and then once that, that final um, Gog and Magog war takes place, uh, then he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. But there's some important realities that I, I want us to uh, understand about the enemy, about Satan. Uh, Satan is a created being. Uh, he was originally a, a high-ranking angel, uh, angel. We see very clearly in 14 and 15 that he is not self-existent, that he was created. And so uh, he is not another God. And he's nowhere, anywhere uh, equal in strength to God. It, the creator is stronger and bigger than the created. And he is far, far less in power than the creator God. No question. Um, I want you to notice, uh, this was one of the things that stood out when I was putting this together. It's Michael, who is an angel, that defeats him. And it's an angel that binds and cast him into the bottomless pit. And that's in chapter 20. And in the latter, uh, later part of chapter 20, where he's thrown into the lake of fire, it just simply mentions that Satan is cast into the lake of fire. It doesn't tell the agency of who did it, but it's almost implied that it's angels that cast him into the lake of fire. There's no explicit mention that only the power of God can defeat Satan. Now, ultimately it is. But God only has to use his servants, the angels, in order to defeat Satan. Satan is not even the most powerful of angels. Satan was defeated by Michael, or, or will be, depending on when that, that, that takes place. He's going to be captured by an unnamed angel in chapter 20. Uh, it, it just simply says that an angel caught him, binds him, and cast him into uh, the bottomless pit. And so he is nowhere near equal in power uh, to God. Uh, and he's defeated. He's defeated in heaven, and he's ultimately going to be defeated on earth. Does not mean that he's powerless. He still has power, great power, greater than human power. Uh, and that's an important consideration, uh, because we are not as powerful as he is. Uh, but he is not as powerful as God by any means but he is a fraud. And that's the thing. His greatest power is deceit. He is a deceiver. He wants to make humanity think he is more than he is. And so when he presents himself or, or when we see him, we see this seven headed creature as though he is all wise. He will sound all wise. Uh, his beast will sound all wise. 
he will look super powerful. Uh, the, the 10 horns, uh, complete power. Uh, and these descriptions like the seven, um, that's a description that's usually uh, reserved for God. But notice how that's applied to him. Not that he is a God, but that he pretends to be like God. And he pretends to have his own powerful Messiah in the beast. And he has his own powerful false prophet. So this unholy trinity that we're going to get uh, introduced to later on in, in chapter 13. And so it, it's important to understand these things about the enemy. Now, he is full of wrath, full of fury, and we're going to see that. And it will be painful, uh, but he is on a leash. He has limited time uh, and limited power. Uh, so uh, verses 10 through 12 brings us to the victory hymn. Uh, it says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night before our God. There's no more place for him. There's no more room for accusations from Satan against believers in heaven. Jesus paid it all, and his blood covers us perfectly. Verse 11, and they have conquered him. This is the brothers, and the brothers uh, who have been accused and all that, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but notice this, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because that he, know, he knows that his time is short. Hmm. So again in Revelation, a hymn is used to explain the hard to understand. So we get a symbolic moment in heaven. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. We see a lamb who has been sacrificed uh, standing on the throne. And then we have hymns that explain that. And in various places, we see that happening through the book. It's an interesting uh, and amazing way that worship is used to explain uh, what is happening. And, and, and that also speaks to the nature of worship. Another little rabbit trail here, the depth of true worship. Uh, that it's not just the, the mindless singing of phrases over and over, but the theological and reality truths uh, that, that just come through in that. Uh, now, I'm not against those kind of things uh, necessarily, but I just want you to see that you know, the hymns have a lot of depth to them. Uh, and I'm not a hymn only kind of guy. Just want you to hear that if you don't know me. Uh, but that's one of the tools that's used here uh, in the book of Revelation. So it's a hymn in three stanzas. The first stanza is the triumph of Christ. Again, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, now the salvation, notice the things that are mentioned, salvation, power, and kingdom of our God. And jointly alongside of that, the authority of his Christ have come. So the kingdom and authority of God and Christ uh, have now come. This is why there's no more room uh, for uh, Satan in heaven. And in part, because salvation has come. And, and, and that is the beautiful thing. Uh, and so the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. Here's the great news. Because of the victory of Christ, our sins are fully covered and forgiven. And the accuser has no place. That's that beautiful refrain in Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Satan cannot bring up anything if you are in Christ to make you guilty before Christ because Christ has paid for all of your sins on the cross. That is great news. And if you happen to be watching this and you're not a believer, friend, I want you to know you have not sinned so much that Jesus cannot forgive you. That you are not so far gone that God's grace cannot reach you. And so I, I'm, I'm glad you're watching. And if you want to know more, just contact me. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Second stanza is the triumph of the believers. And it says that they the believers have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. So this is a statement of reality, and it's also 
uh, an exhortation. It, 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 it lends itself to, to help us to understand what God is truly looking for. And, and it helps to understand that, that victory over the enemy is not the preservation of physical life. It's the preservation of our faith and our testimony, even in the face of death, even if it costs us our physical life, that we persevere in our faith, in our testimony, in our trust and belief in Jesus, that we don't turn aside simply to save our lives. I referenced that, that documentary earlier called, I think it was just simply The Sign. Um, it's a well put together video, but it's also one of those very sensationalized kind of uh, documentaries, <laughs> uh, if you will. And, and it's, it was interesting because I, I just scanned through, I didn't have time to, to watch the whole thing. I generally watch a number of videos about the chapter that I'm gonna be covering just to kind of get a sense of what's out there, but not necessarily watching in full. Um, and it was interesting because it referenced, I think, a, a group called Vivo, uh, which is basically like um, uh, tribulation prepper types. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but, but they showed this um, desert looking field that had these bunkers, uh, underground bunkers that were out there in this community of believers uh, that are preparing for uh, the kind of things that we're seeing in Revelation. And, and part of the scene is you see them uh, on the gun range, you know, practicing firing a pistol and things like that. And, and the, the goal seems to be preservation of life. And folks, you know, as much as I want to preserve my life, we cannot preserve life to the point of sacrificing faith. And, and, and I, I don't mean that we don't do anything, or, and, and that's not what I'm saying at all, but I'm saying we can, we can get into such a self-preservation mode that we miss what true victory really is. And all throughout Revelation, this is the thing, that the faithful saints will go through deep trouble, persecution from the world, the wrath of Satan being poured out on them. But you see the hand of God, the protection of God, uh, preservation of the saints, but not necessarily of their physical lives. The, the reality is Satan can inflict pain and he can inflict death even on the people of God, but he cannot touch their soul. There's no place in heaven for him anymore. Stanza three, it's, it's a mixed stanza of both triumph and trouble. Uh, the first part Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Satan's gone. The accuser is gone. We don't have to smell his stench anymore. We don't have to hear his constant accusations anymore. He is gone. He's got no room here in heaven. On the other hand, he's now been cast to the earth. And so, woe, deep sorrow to you, O earth and sea. Interesting that earth and sea. So it's kind of that totality of the planet. Uh, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So heaven celebrates the exit of Satan and mourns for the final days of earth. Satan knows that his time is short and he is furious. So let's talk about uh, the dragon's fury. So verse 13, uh, and when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings uh, of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water uh, like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her uh, away with the flood. Uh, but the earth came to help the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river uh, that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring and of those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Now that's going to be a connecting line that moves on into to chapter 13 um, uh, because there are no chapter divisions uh, when this was originally written. So for this part, what we see is that uh, the dragon seeing that he's been cast down, he's got no more place in heaven, he's furious, and so he pursues the woman. So we have the, the, the dragon apparently, at least the way that it seems to be construed in this uh, chapter, is um, uh, seeking to devour the male child, and he's pursuing the woman after the fact. So this almost is picking back up uh, before that war in heaven interlude there. Uh, 
And, and, and so he's now after the woman with full force. He's got no more place in heaven. He knows it. He's after God's people. He can't touch God's people in heaven. Uh, and he is after God's people that are still left on earth. But verse 14, the woman is given two wings uh, to fly into the wilderness. Uh, it's interesting. This, this idea uh, is also seen in the Olivet Discourse uh, in Matthew 24, uh, where Jesus talks about when you see the abomination of desolation, flee into the wilderness. Uh, so the Vivo group, they, they may be onto something there of being in the wilderness away from the rest of civilization. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not discounting them entirely. Uh, I may be calling them at one point, uh, but uh, the, the, the woman here is given by God uh, the ability to escape the fullness of the fury of the dragon. Um, so in both of these places, it talks about that she is nourished for three and a half years. Folks, so what I want you to see is that if this is in, indeed a reference to the great tribulation period, notice God's protection in the midst of the fury, in the midst of the great tribulation that is being poured out on the saints of God. Uh, so this is an important thing that is revealed here. There's also that Exodus kind of language, uh, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, with this eagle's wings kind of thing. And that there's been a lot of Exodus language. Uh, the, the plagues, the, the prophets, and so forth that come through that may need to do a section on that at some point where we see the parallels of Exodus to this. Um, and, and so it says that the serpent pours out water uh, like a flood or like a river uh, to sweep away. I don't think that this is necessarily a, a literal flood. I mean, he's he can't touch her directly. Uh, she's, she seems to be out of his reach, but he is pouring out everything that he can and, and such, um, uh, such a fast, intense pace that it's like a flood. So all the different things that are coming out are like that. that that's the imagery that's there. I don't think it's necessarily literally uh, a, a, a water flood that is being pictured there. And again, look at this, verse 16, the earth comes to help the woman. And so even the resources of earth are reaching out to help the people of God. Uh, and so when the, the dragon cannot reach her, he's going after the ones that seem to be separated from the group as a whole or, you know, just the, the rest of the woman. So they, they seem to be collective. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to understand all that's being said there, but it's like the individual components that make up the woman, her offspring, those that belong to the, the believing community uh, are now being pursued. But look at how they're described as the ones who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony. Remember in the second stanza, uh, I mentioned that that is kind of the exhortation. This is what God is looking for. He's looking for people that are faithful in their testimony and their, their witness that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, that he is the one who died uh, for our sins. And my trust is in him and him alone. And the, he, God is God alone, and he is the one that I worship, and that is it. And nothing you can do to me can sway me from that reality. And so this is the, the, the testimony that they hold to. They, they keep the commandments of God in the sense that they remain faithful uh, and pure. Uh, so they, they, they find their identity and their forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. They profess that very clearly, and they hold on to that. And that verse 11 is so critical to help us understand uh, the, the role of Christians uh, within the book. Let me go back to that. They loved not their lives even unto death. This is the, one of the things that you see in a refrain over and over. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. It may cost you your life, but stay faithful. Uh, we need to endure and engage that's the two pictures that we've seen throughout. We endure much persecution, but we are still engaging with the gospel all the way to the end. That's not an easy message, but it's the message that's here. And it's a message to strengthen us and prepare us for the harder days, whether they are now uh, or whether they come a thousand years from now whether we are living in the great tribulation or just tri tribulation in general that has been taking place ever since Jesus ascended. Uh, so all of these are, are meant to help first century Christians who are reading this for the very first time and 21st Christ century Christians uh, who need to take this to heart. 
So here's a few things that we see about the dragon's fury, seeing that he cannot reach the male child. Uh, Jesus, who is ascended into heaven, the dragon pursues the woman, the people of God. Uh, however, she's given wings. And the similar description uh, is given of Israel being brought out of Egypt. In Exodus 19.4, uh, so this is in that Exodus book, or the, 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 the Egypt <laughs> Exodus. Um, we see, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So I, I think this picture of the eagle's wings is intended to help us to see that uh, God is there to help, that we will be in the midst of the wrath, but protected by God in the middle of the wrath. I've heard people use Exodus as a parallel for um, a, a pre-tribulation rapture, but it, it's actually an argument against a pre-tribulation rapture because God is indeed pouring out his wrath on Egypt, but he is protecting them in the midst of the wrath. The people of, uh, of Israel do not come out of Egypt until the 10 plagues have been poured out in their fullness. And then he brings them out. In the same way, we've already seen uh, in the, the trumpets and the bowls of wrath, and even in here, there's that description that even in the midst of the dragon's fury, even in the midst of the wrath of God being poured out, there is protection for the people of God. And that does not mean that we will not feel the effects because the first four of those plagues that are being poured out uh, in the, the trumpets and the bowls affect the environment around us. But the people, we ourselves, uh, have that measure of protection on us. And it may not entirely be uh, fully physical in every sense because we may die, but that does not mean that we're unprotected. Our souls, the most important part, will be protected and we find victory in remaining faithful all the way to the end. But again, notice how even the earth helps. It swallows up that flood of things that are coming along. It's very reminiscent of Elijah. He lived in a deeply apostate time in Israel's uh, history. And when God brought about that plague, that judgment against Israel, the earth itself, so to speak, the, the ravens and the brook take care of Elijah during that deep famine. So this short paragraph really encapsulates the story of Revelation as a whole, that Satan has been waging war on the saints, will continue to do so. The saints are going to suffer, but they're ultimately going to be preserved by God and be victorious in the end. And that's incredible news. Uh, if you've seen other things that just really stood out to you, I hope that you'll leave that in the comments below of, you know, what you're taking away from Revelation 12, what encourages you uh, as you're reading this, the bigger picture that you see, whatever it is that God has been revealing, uh, man, if you could share that with the community, uh, that would be great. I'd appreciate that. So here's some key takeaways uh, that I, I see. Uh, number one, it's not about me. Uh, this has been going on since the beginning. And when I say it's not about me, I'm not talking about Randy Bond. I'm talking about anyone who's listening, any person on planet Earth, that Revelation is, and what we're seeing in this, in the great war that is going on, it's not a personalized thing. It's been going on since the beginning. So longer than I've been around, uh, this has been happening. Satan hates humanity in general and God's people in particular. I, it, it's an interesting thing that we as the image bearers of God are a stench in the nostrils of Satan uh, because we bear his image. Um, he hates God, and so he hates God's people. That's been going on from, from the beginning. Uh, but also one of the key things that we see through this and the rest of Revelation and other parts of Scripture, Satan's reach is limited. It's both limited in scope and limited in time. Uh, limited in scope in the sense that, yeah, he may be able to, uh, to make it possible for us to be hungry, uh, cold, naked, homeless, uh, and even dead. All those are within the scope of what he can do. But we were reminded by Jesus in Matthew 10, 28, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. But he's also limited in time. That's one of the key things. When he's cast out, he knows his time is short, and that's why he's furious. Uh, he is trying to inflict as much damage as he, can, as he can in the short amount of time that he can. So uh, we overcome uh, the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. We don't overcome the beast by forming militias and going after him. That's just not the way it's going to play out. We, we don't overcome 
by simply hiding, although we see that wilderness aspect uh, in there, that that may be part of what has to happen in days that, that are to come. Uh, but ultimately, we overcome because Jesus has won the victory for us, and we hide in that victory. We cling to that, and that is what he has done for us on the cross. By dying in our place and taking the punishment that should have been ours and offering us his righteousness. One of my favorite verses is uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The most unfair exchange ever is that God takes our sin when we come to understand that we're sinners and we need a savior and that savior is Jesus and Jesus alone. He takes all of our sin and puts it on Jesus and Jesus bears all the punishment on the cross that we deserve. But here's the other part is that he takes his righteousness, the perfect sinless righteousness of Jesus, applies it to us so that from that moment on, whenever God looks at us, he looks at us through the blood of Jesus, through the life of Jesus, through the perfection, through the lens of Jesus, so that he sees the perfection of Jesus in us. To him be the glory and power and honor and glory forever and ever. Hey, if you've got uh, questions, I hope that you'll leave those in the comments below. Uh, always appreciate the, the likes and shares uh, that you might give. And if you want to follow uh, more of these, I'm going to leave a, a link for you here at the end for the rest of our uh, videos that we have so far. Hope that you'll su subscribe so that you can uh, take advantage of those when they are released in the future. Until we see you next time, uh, may the Lord richly bless you and Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.